So this, this is my first uh, link. I think Richard sent this one to me, I believe. Uh, sunlight and air can make fuel. How about that? <clears throat> yes, that is the one I sent you. <laughs> it is possible to create fuel from air and sunlight. <clears throat> That's amazing, isn't it? Um, it's talking about COP26, of course. Um, so how did it all work? Here you are. This is how it all works. You can, oh, have I pressed the what's it? The two little what's it? So, in a mini refinery system on the roof of EDH's machine laboratory. Was that working all right? Yes. Yeah. I didn't click those two boxes, Richard. <laughs> also no, it's still working all right, but you need to, it says more videos, you need to close that down. Yeah, close that down. More videos? Mm. Yeah, we got a thing over <laughs> us, that's it. You got it. Sunlight and ambient air. There's the because air. this chain incorporates three thermochemical conversion processes, the capture of CO2 and water from air, solar splitting, and subsequent liquefaction. CO2 and water are extracted directly from the air in an adsorption-desorption process. Oh. Both are then fed into the solar reactor at the focus of a parabolic concentrator. The solar radiation is concentrated by a factor of 3,000, generating heat at a temperature of 1,500 degrees Celsius inside the solar reactor. The heart of the reactor is a ceramic structure made of cerium oxide. Here, a two-step thermochemical reaction takes place. In the first step, cerium oxide is reduced and oxygen is released. In the second step, CO2 and water are added to produce syngas, a mixture of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. The cerium oxide absorbs oxygen and oxidizes. The initial state is restored and the cycle can begin again. Only the first step of the reaction requires an input of solar radiation. Two solar reactors are therefore operated in parallel and the concentrated sunlight is directed at each one alternately. This ensures optimum use of sunlight and improves efficiency. Depending on the method used, syngas can be converted into numerous different hydrocarbons, into kerosene, gasoline, methanol, or other liquid fuels. These are carbon neutral because the combustion releases only as much CO2 as was removed from the air for their production. The entire process chain has been demonstrated under real field conditions. This demonstration represents a milestone in the production of carbon neutral synthetic fuels, which could play a particularly important role in sustainable aviation. You see, that's what they're concerned about, aviation. <laughs> well, that's probably the worst COT polluter at the moment, isn't it? Two millilitres of methanol in a seven hour day run. Yes. Not exactly a lot, is it? <laughs> Couldn't run an aircraft. Well, it's only millilitres, no, I suppose not. <laughs> yeah, well, <clears throat> would it ever work in uh, when it's scaled up? It doesn't well, show you the size of that uh, reflector either. No, no. Um, it could operate without a fresh water supply, making it suitable for deserts. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and so on. Should yes, I so. be concerned it's producing carbon monoxide? No, because it said it, that's what it said. It equaled itself out. It only produced what it emitted. Yeah. 76 comments. That's probably worth reading, saying what rubbish it all is. <laughs> um, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Celebrating 10 years of greening the desert in Jordan. Hmm. A lot less water in the air in the Sahara than in Switzerland. Uh, yes. The whole concept seems to be dubious investment for many reasons. The only viable option I could think of was retrofitting a few large scale existing non photovoltaic power plants, such as Morocco and Arizona, where sunk costs of past investments could be recovered. So, um, yeah, well. Because you don't know how much energy producing the solar cells requires. Nobody ever tells you that bit. No. So anyway, oh, 
five kilowatt five kilowatts is that for seven hours to produce 30 milliliters of an ethanol energy density of 24 megajoules per liter we've only got 720 kilojoules of output for 126 megajoules of input that's great five point five seven percent yes this is exactly the difficulty isn't it <laughs> and you need seven hours of sunshine as well. Uh, well we get that every day here, don't we? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yes. Field of barley will win if averaged over a year. Hmm. Well, so that is a bit of a non starter, I reckon. And yeah, it's a red herring. So we'll look for the next one. This one. Um, the laser cannon to project a second roll of the die. Yes, uh, laser cannons, this is a wartime and military thing. Um, apparently five years ago, a mere five years ago, Britain uh, jumped into this field and then jumped out again, I think. Uh, so now they're coming back in again and uh, they're just testing it on the Royal Navy's Type 23 frigates. Uh, the Zappa will be detecting, tracking, and engaging and countering unmanned aerial vehicles, according to the Ministry of Defence. So what it does is, is well, you'll have a look in a minute, uh, a radio frequency demonstrator used to dem for detecting and tracking drones will be also fitted to an Army issue MAN SV via Raleigh. All these projects are said to be creating 50 jobs. 50? Yeah. 50, yes. Five zero, yes. Um, Directed energy weapons, that's what they're talking about. A world leader in the research. Excellent. <laughs> Where does it say that? <laughs> oh, yes. Um, so, we've, yes. So, the MOD uh, added six billion pounds is due to be spent over the next four years and hope that current projects will be in the test. What did I hear today about the number of billions of pounds wasted by the government on these? To try to help businesses last year that have not been repaid or was snaffled illegally because they didn't have proper safeguards. Shouldn't they have expected that in the first place? I did. Well, yes, I'm sure they did as well, but they didn't didn't do it. Implement the the, the uh, safeguards. Yeah, you know, proper early enough. Anyway, uh, well, that was fifty million pounds, wasn't it? Fifty billion pounds or something stupid. Mm -hmm. Seventeen billion they couldn't get back. And this is only that was, a, that was a report by the audit office yesterday. Yeah. Yes, yes. Anyway, um, this is a project known as Team Hersa, a snappy official title. <laughs> the word Horsa, Hersa means. Uh, has no, no, no definition. <laughs> but they do in America, and it means a type of Arab. A type of Arab. <laughs> and it's all military formation. So there. And, so, <laughs> there you are, 2016, five years, a mere five years ago, they became a dragon fire directed energy weapon. Everything went mysteriously quiet until it was re emerged. Um, meanwhile, the mirror's been melted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In America is doing uh, electromagnetic rail guns, like the laser cannon project. They have yet to come out of the experimental stage. Rail guns use electromagnetic force to accelerate a projectile to hypersonic speeds, requiring huge reserves of electrical energy. They use it's using... like the electric trains do, isn't it? Uh, is it? Well, the electric, there's electric trains that do exactly that, don't they? They magnetize the rail and that's what shoots them forward. Oh. oh. I think Japan have got quite, quite a few. But they're bullet trains. I uh, Maybe their bullet trains are like that. I'm not quite sure if it's only the bullet trains, but it, certainly they've got a number of trains that do exactly that. They're not hypersonic speeds, obviously, but... I remember seeing many years ago, Professor Lathwaite, or Braithwaite, was, yeah. uh, he'd, he'd actually started this thing off and he was, talking about it in one of these Christmas lectures they have for kids. Yes. 
Um, and then, of course, good old Britain decides uh, to pull out of it and let somebody else, let another country benefit from it all. Par for the course for this country, seems I to think it, all these things are the cost, isn't it? Are you, how much are you prepared to invest in a very uh, doubtful future? Yeah, but the trouble is that we, we, when we come up with these things, we let somebody else benefit from yeah we give away the secrets yeah yes i couldn't agree more they're talking there about the the is it the greeks who used to polish their shields and set fire to the sails of a roman fleet in syracuse <laughs> that was because they were so shiny they reflected the sunlight yeah i think it was archimedes i think had the idea and they polished all their shields wouldn't they have needed um parabolic shape shields well perhaps a story where they turned around the other way of course <laughs> oh, yes <laughs> it's archimedes idea anyway you see the uh, the comments here uh, polished metal shields each man one meter square shield and a thousand men quite mm. simple but they said not in yorkshire <laughs> 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 well there's that curved office wall in london with <laughs> which Directs, uh, concentrates sunlight, doesn't it? Where is that? So yeah, it's it's one of the London ones because it's got glass on it and people get burnt by it. Is yes. that the Barbican, Richard? No, I don't think it is. I mean, what else have they got? Um, jobs, oh, 50 new jobs. Wowee, yes. A market for chrome plated drones. <laughs> chrome plating doesn't work. Ever sit on a chrome bunker on a hot day? I don't quite see that. Does it get hot or something? I can't remember. Um, anyway, there's lots of comments there of great interest, I feel sure. I'm going to move on to the next one. The, the, good, the good news, Richard, is that the recycling people have taken my airing frame without me having to bend it. Oh, well, well, well done. <laughs> I thought this, this particular thing was quite interesting. Um, I could <laughs> Solid state things without blades. Oh, hold on, wait for the adverts to go. This episode is brought to you by Brilliant. Wind power is one of the fastest growing renewable sources in the world that works well at scale, but it's not perfect. A wind turbine's massive size and moving parts make them challenging to roll out because of the space they take up, as well as the maintenance. But what if we had scaled down that power to something that could fit in your roof? It'd be self-contained with smaller moving parts, or maybe no blades or moving parts at all. Let's look at some of the future alternatives for harnessing wind power. I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecipher. That's an egg-shaped head. Yeah, no, yes, yeah, poor chap. It's not hard to see that along with solar, wind power has been a major player all over the world in lowering our carbon emissions from fossil fuels. According to the latest global wind report, 93 gigawatts of new global wind power capacity was installed in 2020. Got that number? You see where see where Britain is on this list? Australia, no. Britain isn't even shown there. No. I thought we had loads of these things. I thought we had lots of wind power. Where is it? Strange that. With the US and China leading the way, and currently 743 gigawatts of wind power capacity is installed worldwide, making it the green power source with the most decarbonization potential per megawatt. It's helping to avoid over 1.1 billion tons of CO2 globally. But wind turbines aren't all good. As I mentioned in a previous video, wind turbines have several downsides. Harnessing wind requires high upfront costs, and the energy generation isn't effective for individual homes or small-scale installations, as they are at large scale. The construction of wind farms has also had an impact on wildlife. And while they do kill a good number of birds and bats every year, when you look at those numbers in context, it's blown a little bit out of proportion. Peter, can you put subtitles on? Uh, oh, I can do, yeah. Why can't you understand him? No, better. No. <laughs> I think it's because you haven't pressed the two buttons still, Peter. Well, I'll put it on now. All right. Yes, yeah. at the bottom. Yeah, the subtitles are yeah. there. 500,000 birds die at wind farms each year. I compare that to 2.4 billion birds that are killed in the US each year by domesticated cats or the 1 million birds that die from flying into windows. 
And there's some simple solutions for wind turbines that are proving effective, like just painting one of the blades black. It's helping to protect the birds. But there's also the fact that turbines have a lot of moving parts, like the gearbox, which requires a decent amount of maintenance. They need to be checked two to three times a year. And this is where a solid state wind power arrives in the scene. In 2013, researchers at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands removed the need for moving mechanical components and created UECON. That's how you say that acronym which stands for Electrostatic Wind Energy Converter, kicking off the development of the ion wind generator concept. Now, while it's still very much in development, it provides significantly lower maintenance costs, less wear and tear, and no noise issues. And how it works is kind of fascinating. UConn utilizes wind to create a flow of charged particles to the air that can be tapped into to produce electricity. In this case, water droplets are used to hold a positive charge, and when the wind blows through them, this movement of the droplets produces electricity that can be transferred to the grid. A prototype of UECON is installed at Delft University of Technology, but I couldn't find any information if it's still actually running or not. Now, an obvious downside of this idea is the reliance on water to carry the charge. You need a water line run to the installations, and it wouldn't work in freezing temperatures. There's another idea called the Solid State Wind Energy Transformer, with the unfortunate acronym SWEAT. It's <laughs> developed by Richard Epstein. His approach is very similar to what the Dutch developed, but instead of using water, his concept uses ionic currents to produce electricity. This process is called electrohydrodynamics. Richard Epstein described the prototype as a series of 55 parallel aluminum wires strung between two 8.5 meter tall wooden masts, separated by about eight meters on a flat roof. And all the wires were electrically isolated from the masts. In the prototype, there were two kinds of wires, attractor wires, which were the plane wires, and emitter wires that contained small tufts of seven micrometer diameter carbon fibers attached about every 15 centimeters. When small negative currents flow through the emitter wires, the tufts create a coronal discharge, releasing negative ions into the air. It's not that different from the ionic air purifiers that were all the rage in the early 2000s, if you remember the ionic breeze. I'm still trying to forget those commercials. So just like the UECON concept, the wind blowing past the wires carries the negative ions with it, and the array gets a slight positive charge. This causes electrons to flow from the ground, which can be collected as electricity. The prototype developed by Epstein has just 1 20th of a watt of power. <laughs> it's not that much. But it's just a prototype to prove the concept, and it's still in the first steps of development. Now, utilizing the same principles of UECON, the Dutch Wind Wheel Corporation is developing a 160 to 180 meter tall building that is going to be a landmark of Rotterdam. It looks kind of like a gigantic donut. The hole in the center will be putting this solid state energy generation to work. The structure is also intended to pull together multiple eco-friendly technologies like rainwater capture, wetland water filtration, and solar energy. Not to mention apartments, a hotel, and a sky bar. Who doesn't love a good sky bar? It's expected to be built sometime between 2022 and 2025. Now, as cool as that tech is, it's still very much in the early phases of development. But there's some other technologies that could be hitting the residential and city market sooner. Another type of wind generator without moving parts has been developed by Vortex Blades. But warning, it looks a little weird. This Spanish company has developed a vortex-induced vibration resonant wind generator, which is based on the principle of vortex shedding. The generator is built with the shape of a cylinder, producing electricity through the alternator system when the mast oscillates. The bottom of the rod is firmly attached to the ground, but the upper portion is unconstrained and able to vibrate. The structure is built with materials used in traditional wind turbine blades, which is resins reinforced with carbon or glass fiber. The blades of wind turbines get rid of the mechanical elements that can suffer wear by friction. But how does this wiggling, vibrating column produce energy? Well, to understand this, we need to jump a little bit back into the world of fluid mechanics. As wind passes by a blunt body, the flow is changed, producing a cyclical vortices pattern known as vortex shedding. Now imagine placing a cylinder partially submerged into running water. If the water is moving too fast or too slow, the vortices that form around the cylinder are chaotic. But if the speed of the water and the frequency of the object are matched, the vortices form more consistently and will exert force on the cylinder, causing it to move. Every body or structure has a natural frequency. If the frequency of these vortices is close enough to the body's structural frequency, it starts to oscillate, resonating with the wind. This is also known as vortex-induced vibration. You've probably seen or heard of the ramifications of this effect on bridges that weren't designed properly, like the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Engineers and architects design bridges and skyscrapers to avoid this effect. They design structures that have different resonant frequencies from the wind's resonant frequency. But Vortex Bladeless is doing the exact opposite in order to put vortex-induced vibration to work. 
Vortex's mass geometry is specifically designed to achieve maximum performance with typical wind speeds. To convert these vibrations into electricity, Vortex bladeless turbines utilize an alternator system made by coils and magnets. They can adapt the Vortex dynamics with no gears, shafts, or rotating parts. This design provides reduced maintenance and rules up the need for grease. And this magnetic confinement design acts as a tuning system, so it can increase the stiffness of the system according to the deformation that the wind causes. It's basically adjusting and synchronizing its natural frequency to match the wind's frequency. If you compare turbines of similar sizes, a vortex bladeless turbine harvests about 30% of the area that's covered by a three-bladed wind turbine design. This is called swept area. The bottom line vortex technology is less power efficient than traditional three-bladed turbines, since the power production is proportional to the swept area of the turbine. On the flip side, a smaller swept area also means more bladeless turbines can be placed in the same area making up for that efficiency gap. Now running at low to medium wind speeds, it's able to generate the same power for less cost. It's about 45% cheaper than a traditional three-bladed design. The Vortex Tacoma model, which is 2.7 meters high, has an estimated power output of 100 watts. And the company expects the Vortex Tacoma models to have similar prices to medium high production solar panels. Now getting closer to the residential market for wind turbines, Savonius turbines have been gaining in popularity. These wind turbines are simple drag type devices that consist of two or three scoops. Due to their curvature, the scoops experience less drag when moving against the wind than moving with it, which makes it extract less wind power than other lift type turbines of similar size. However, they are very cost effective and can operate regardless of the wind direction. The blades in the turbine have no mechanism to alter the angles, and they're more bird and bat friendly than conventional three bladed turbines. Now, with that in mind, the Iceland based company Icewind has been manufacturing Savonius turbines for residential and commercial applications. Their CW100 model, which is sold as the Freya here in the US, is designed to deliver long lasting performance with little or no maintenance for over 25 years. This 1.5 meter high turbine is able to withstand speeds up to 130 miles per hour or about 60 meters per second and generate up to 600 watts. The company sells each turbine for $3,200 and a complete on grid system with a 1.5 kilowatt inverter for $4,180. In the US, the cost of a set of solar panels to produce the same 600 watts would be around $1,900. The turbine's a bit more expensive, but you also get the potential for producing power during the night. But the innovations on wind power don't stop there. Helsium is a startup based in Salt Lake City, Utah, and is hoping its portable wind turbine will be the next big innovation in clean energy. The company's been developing what they call a power pot, which is a small scale wind turbine designed specifically to work in towns and cities. The power pod does have a blade system, but it's completely contained within the shell, making it safe for kids, pets, and wildlife since it has no external moving parts. The wind generator shape can collect wind from any direction, changing directions, or even multiple directions at once. A one kilowatt wind turbine could produce up to three times more power than a normally mounted turbine of a similar size and swept area. This extra power comes from the advanced blade system of the pod, which boosts the wind speed by 40%. To make this happen, the power pod takes air and funnels it into a smaller exit, which speeds it up before hitting the internal blades. In a way, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the Dyson vacuum cleaner's Vortex cycle. Now, much like some of the other turbines I've talked about, the interesting angle with the power pod is its capability of being either connected to a building on its own or paired with solar to diversify your power sources. And the power pod's design means it can be installed anywhere, house rooftops, public buildings, fences, you name it. Nick Hodges, the founder of Halcyon, created a map showing the average daily power generated from a one kilowatt power pod compared to a one kilowatt solar panel system in different parts of the world. In most cities, the power pod could perform equal or greater than a conventional one kilowatt solar panel system. A big reason for this is the 24 seven operation of solar is limited to daylight hours and has lower production on cloudy or rainy days. Although the power pod isn't for sale quite yet and the specifications aren't well known, it's an interesting idea to bring wind generation in a more flexible package closer to our homes. The power pod will most likely be available sometime towards the end of 2021. As we can see, wind power generation isn't limited to traditional three-bladed turbines that we're used to seeing everywhere. These innovative, small-scale, lower-maintenance wind generators with no or hidden moving parts hold a lot of promise. In the coming years, we'll probably be seeing more of these alternatives on top of office buildings and even our homes. I think I'd offer the power pod over a wiggling column but I won't be too picky. But if you'd like to understand more about how the Vortex play design even works, or how the ions flow from the solid state designs that I talked about, you can learn a lot from the electricity and magnetism course at Brilliant. Stop what I think at that point. Um, but I'm just get out of 
maximum would set it. Um, well, any comments on that one? <laughs> one of the problems is you're bending in that last bit, you're bending the air and that absorbs energy. Therefore, it's not as efficient as it could be if you let it blow straight through. So I'm not totally convinced about the logic of it. You mean the, you mean the green thing? The, yes. Yeah, the power part. It, 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 it takes it into a funnel, then it bends it at right angles to go through the turbine. Well, that absorbs an awful lot of energy. Hmm. It's a thought. Well, I only know that because we used to put pipes in Nimrod aircraft and measure the airflow. And as soon as you went around a bend, you lost half the airflow. Because it it's got turbulence on the bend, if that's the word for it. Yes. Well, it does depend a little bit on how near that uh, rotor thing was to the input that you could see. Yes, very true. If it was right next to it, it would be more efficient, obviously. Yes. So, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. All right, okay. Uh, any other comments, anybody? Could, I, I missed the point about how, a, what's the transducer from what the wiggling movement into electricity? How does that work? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> anybody, did anybody pick that up? Um, no, nobody did, obviously. There's bound to be some, something here in one of the comments. He doesn't have an actual article about how it works, does he? What's he called? Fascinating. No, he's called this guy. Brilliant. That's it. He's brilliant, obviously. Please visit brilliant or brilliant org stroke undecided. Yes. If you want to go and look at that. Well, I thought uh, having no blades would be a good thing, really, because um, there is a lot of maintenance on wind turbines, as we know. It's a bit less now we've got these neodymium magnets, isn't that right, Richard? Well, they're stronger, therefore you get more power out from a given thrust in, I suppose. What it means is you don't need a big gearbox like you did on the older version. Yeah, absolutely. So that is where the maintenance problems come. Of course, as soon as you put a gearbox in, that's another loss of energy. Yeah, of course. Anyway, my next one is a, a, a U3A video that was done um, some little while ago, 11th of August, I think. Um, this is not all of it. I didn't, re I recorded this, uh, but I didn't record all of it. But this just chap here, um, he's quite a good speaker talking about, um, well, if, if you listen, you'll see. It's about how the world has ev evolved and so forth. I'll play a little bit of it for you at least. Yes. We've been sending robotic probes out into the solar system for the past few decades. Um, now, if you look at our, our own galaxy, the Milky Way, Milky Way, it formed as a sphere about 11 billion years ago, or maybe earlier, uh, and then um, began to form in, um, in the disk. And it grew by um, stars forming from the gas that was in the galaxy, but also through mergers with other galaxies. And so we now think there are at least 300 billion, probably more stars in the flat disk of our uh, Milky Way galaxy. And it's about 150,000 light years across. So in other words, if you wanted to travel at the speed of light from side to side, it would take 150,000 years. And um, we're now mapping this in great detail. Uh, Gaia ESA satellite from the uh, European Space Agency has been mapping that for quite some time. Uh, and it's, it's, it's looking at uh, about 100,000 stars per hour uh, for five years, and it's going to scan the sky, the whole galaxy, for at least 70 times. I thought that was a staggering number of stars per hour. It's 100,000. <laughs> so. It's using a one big billion pixel camera, and it's mapping each star's position, its motion, its distance, and its brightness. And so our solar system, as part of that galaxy, and centered around our sun, formed about 4.57 billion years ago. And from a thing called a protoplanetary disk. Uh, and really, it was the dust and debris left over from the formation of our sun, which, which contains 99.86% for all of the mass in our solar system. 
And so Earth and all of the planets are just the dust left over. Uh, and Earth itself formed about 4.54 billion years ago by accretion of some of the material left over. And so what that, the reason I'm saying this is that just to express that the Earth is only one third the age of the universe. Now, um, there are a range of orbits around any given star which could support, potentially support liquid water. Uh, and given sufficient atmospheric pressure, uh, uh, is that enough for you now on that video? Well, I'm going to I only understand about a quarter of it. I suppose the answer is yes. Oh. <laughs> well, you can always look at it again. Yeah, uh, quite. I've got a 40. Did we, Peter? Yeah. Peter, did we talk last time about the uh, results from the Gaia telescope that Brian Cox was talking about? How, with the sequences of, of they've been taking of, of the movement of the stars within our galaxy, they've discovered that we we are there is a the, there was a collision of two galaxies. There's a whole. Um, yeah area of the stars are actually moving in different directions to the main rotating uh, orbits around the center of, of the, the Milky Way. Um, and so that they estimate this collision must have taken place, I've forgotten, seven, seven billion years ago or something like that. Uh, and there's in fact two, two collisions of our Milky Way with, with local, local galaxies. And they are talking about local galaxies. Did we discuss that last time, or, or, or was that a, a recent universe program? It was on the universe program, but I, I think it was talking about Andromeda is coming towards us now and will crash through us in the future. But there's also the uh, what's a, there's megalonic clouds as well down Australia way. They they were yeah. crashed, they've crashed into you know, already crashing into our uh, galaxy now. But um, no, I think you need to um, look a bit more. This, this particular guy has got an interesting way of putting things across. Uh, he's just an ordinary UCA member from East of Devon, I notice. Um, it's well worth looking at the rest of his, uh, rest of his uh, video. So uh, that'll be a link that I'll send on to you, obviously. Um, so we only looked at two minutes of his 42 minutes um, talk. Well worth the I big boat. The Sorry? big bonus is that he doesn't have that dreadful music that accompanies universe programs. Oh yes, I know. <laughs> they have to have music, don't they? Yes. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> I'll go on to the next one. We haven't got all day for that, have we? <clears throat> ah, the solar orbiter. I think Richard sent me this one as well. Solar orbiter seems to seem to fascinate Richard. Isn't that right? Oh, yeah, it does in a funny sort of way. Well, the solar orbiter, for those who don't know, is a, the uh, satellite that's going to fly very close to the sun. In fact, it's already happened. Um, and um, it has to be careful how it uh, orients itself because the sun's very hot, obviously. <laughs> um, so I just, have we heard anything about that, Richard? Whether it's happened? Uh, no, we haven't. I mean, they were worried about bringing it back because it had to fly fairly close to the space station. And that's where they were complaining about the Russians exploding a rocket almost on top of the space station. I thought there was a little video of it down here somewhere. Oh, no, it wasn't. I thought there was. Um, oh, well. Um, yes, the Russians' anti-satellite missile demonstration. Yes, that's what you said, wasn't it? Yes, absolutely, yes. Yes, it was a bit, um, bit silly, that, wasn't it? He did it deliberately. Well, how, how do you stop the Russians doing anything if they got online to? Or have you found a way? No, no. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we really, at 12 kilometers per second, we'd be a really effective asset weapon. Not quite understand what he's talking about there. Um, the team already assessed if the first trajectory correction maneuver um, needed adjusting, the good news was following Tuesday's meeting, it didn't. <clears throat> so the first TCM, they have all these abbreviations. 
of trajectory correction in the window um, will occur just before midnight on the 26th. Um, this will be six hours from its closest approach to Earth. Hmm. And I see. That's why it's called 6H. Um, we'll compute a series of alternative trajectories that will be checked by ESA space debris office known against known objects. Hmm. Yes. Uh, the idea is to find something from the sun, I guess. And what do you say? It's to measure the temperature of the sun in places, I think. That's its main aim, if that's the word for it. Well, they're talking here about the trajectory of it and things like that, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. And they're worried about the debris flying about, which is um, not unreasonable. <laughs> um, so, uh, the infamous missile shen shenanigans in orbit. Well, <laughs> Oh, yes. I see Martin's disappeared. Has he? Oh, poor chap. Come back, Martin. Um, because the throat's the nice fat. <laughs> He's always going there, yes. Yes, okay, so... Uh, oh, there we are. The instruments are collecting science. That's clever. Um, so we're getting that close to the sun. The heat shield has also been performing well, which is just as well. Um, De-icing to warm up the backside. <laughs> um, yes, so another one on space, yes. Right, so I'm going to move on again, I think. It's already 10 foot. This one I thought was fascinating. Uh, shrinking a camera to the size of a grain of salt. Have you, did you come across that one, Richard? No. Ah, well, I, I found it for you. <laughs> that's, that's what it's like, like that. and it's got little cylinders on it like that. Um, I call that a meta surface. Which is still Are they still, is it taking stills or moving? Well, I think it could do anything, to be honest. Uh, so it, it could, you, we could get a, uh, yeah, I suppose up, up our, round our arteries, we could get a, a real, it'd be quite interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, it, it's an interesting article. Um, it is in the human body and enables sensing of small, super small robots. <laughs> The actual fact, you probably don't realise it, but the camera in your phone is not much bigger than that. Really? Yes. But well, this is even smaller, I think. Uh, yeah, it is. But I'm say what I'm saying is that it's probably a hundred times smaller, but the one in your camera is pretty small, and you can float around your veins if you wanted to. Well, up to, up to man, it's this fuzzy, distorted images with a limited field of view has been the, what's happened in the past. Yeah, that's because of the lens, though, rather than anything else, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. This doesn't have a lens. This has a system that's, uh, with these cylinders. Um, it tells you about it, how it works down here somewhere. Um, uh, the traditional camera uses curved glass or plastic lenses to bend the light rays. The new optical system relies on a technology called a metasurface, which can produce, be produced much like a computer chip just half a millimetre wide. The metasurface is studied with a 1.6 million cylindrical posts, each roughly the size of a human immo immunodeficiency virus, <laughs> or HIV. Um, each post has a unique geometry and functions like an optical antenna, varying the design of each post is necessary to correctly shape the entire optical wavefront. With the help of machine learning algorithms, the posts interact with light com combined to produce the highest quality images and widest view field of view for full color meta surface cameras to develop to date. See, all clever stuff. 
Um, the only thing is, is that not the same as saying instead of in one lens, it's got whatever many million rods it's got, and each rod is a lens? I'm not quite sure. I thought they were carefully shaped in some way so that light, when it enters the top of the cylinder, would be directed downwards, wouldn't it? Uh, internal reflection. So yes, forth. indeed. But what I'm saying is, will one of those rods give you a picture of any score at all? And I think the answer is no. No, that's why you need 1.6 million of them. Exactly. <laughs> Which is only the same as having a lens. Well, yes, in the end, but it doesn't use a lens. <laughs> so, I guess. Unless uh, you call it a lens, of course. Oh, they, they reckon that because of the way they're doing it, they get a, they don't get blurring at the edges of the frame and they get a very high quality image. Yeah, that's um, because you can adjust the length of the rods at the edge of the image, at the edge of the lens, effectively. Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. Um, but how are they then capturing that then, Tudor? With a photo diode on the end of it. Well, we don't know, well, presumably, yes. Yeah. So do they actually say anywhere? Um, turn, turn optics, turn optics, I see. Um, yes, we need to know a bit more. Uh, the surfaces are made of silicon nitride. Mm -hmm. First system to use the surface optical technology at the front end and neural based processing at the back end. Oh, yeah, that's what, how they do it. Neural based processing is what they do. <laughs> um, I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, is there any more to it? Um, uh, so, would it be used? Would it? only work if you had a good light source. Uh, I didn't say anything about that. I thought it said that they're remarkably good at high quality pictures. Uh, I think it's a bit like all the cameras. They rely on a video amplifier after you capture the image. So presumably it doesn't matter how dark it is, if you amplify it enough, you can still see the image. There are no comments on this one, is there? No. Page. That came from the science blog. Um, but I thought it was interesting, and I hadn't come across it anywhere else. No, uh, exactly, yeah. If I click on this little camera symbol, it might open up Google to find similar images, at least. Visually similar images, yes. Perhaps it's something like that, I don't know. Uh, Daily Mail had it, so oh, in the Daily Mail, fancy that. Must be true then. <laughs> Crisp full colour images on a par with a lens lenses five hundred thousand times larger. That's pretty good, isn't it? That's exactly what we just read. Just it just hasn't shown one. Sorry, it just hasn't shown one of those images, has it? Uh, oh, I see what you mean, yes. Um, <coughs> yeah, yeah, anything further? Is well. that a typical male assertion with then no facts behind it? Now, here we are, some pictures here, look. <coughs> That's a state of the art with standard optics, and this is with its new one, neuro nano optics. It's the same object, I presume. I don't know. Well, here we are, what's this? Aside from a little blurring near the edges of the frame, the images the tiny camera captures left are comparable to those taken with a regular full-size camera set up on the right. It's interesting. It, the one on the right has got fringing on. The one on the left hasn't. No, other way around. The tiles are white all over, where the other one has got yes. the netting around the corners. Yeah, you're right. That's quite impressive, though, isn't it, really? It is, considering the size of it, yes. Uh, how could it be used? Ah, um, endoscopic things, yeah. <clears throat> Felix Heider, yes, I thought it was a woman. Um, to turn surfaces into sensors. You wouldn't need three cameras on the back of your <laughs> The whole back of your camera would be one giant camera. 
Yes, I see. Well, there you go. Oops, here we go. Software to allow digital camera to see round corners and through shadows. Oh, we've got a video as well. My name's Natalie Waters. I have two boys and I'm a full time foster oh, care. Good. Do we need to know that? My life can be very unpredictable, which again gives me little time. Kind this of is an advert you're watching. I know, I can't stop it. <laughs> It doesn't look like I can stop it anyway. Rushing out the door yeah. on the go and something evil. I do like this. Oh, for goodness sake. Uh, boys are not to believe it. I think we're going to forget that idea. Um, it must be nearly there, though, Peter, just by the yellow line. Yeah, it's got to that far, I suppose, yes. <laughs> do you want to bother with it a bit more? Yeah, definitely going to say I'm the corner. Never mind, up to you. Our experimental setup comprises a visible white wall from which there is a hidden monitor of unknown distance. There is a rectangular occlusion object of unknown position at the corner. An ordinary 4 megapixel digital camera is pointed towards the wall. The camera's field of view is shown on green. An unknown pattern is displayed upon the monitor. The light from the monitor hits every point in the Lambertian imaging wall, apart from those which are occluded. A measurement is then taken with the camera by combining multiple exposures to give an effective exposure length of around 3.5 seconds. This method is used as the input to our algorithm, which aims to reconstruct the images or patterns displayed in a given scene. For a given scene, feeding the captured image through our computational algorithm recovers an estimate of the hidden object and hidden scene image. In addition to being able to clearly resolve larger features like the general shape, redness of the head and yellow face, Small features such as the white patches are well resolved, and hints of the even smaller features such as two eyes and the unibrow are also visible. I don't think I want to use that as a spy camera, although I might be wrong. By using a suitable oh, digitalization, there's a long way to go on this video. Look. We can form a light transport matrix which describes oh, yeah. it. the presence of an occluding object in the scene is extremely important as it provides a significant boost in the conditioning of the light transport matrix by introducing greater variation between the columns due to the discontinuity it creates. That completely baffles me what they're going to trying to get at. Well, I think we'll, we'll bypass that for the moment. I think it's only the light reflected from the wall that gives you the picture on the other side. Yes, yeah, but it, it's not taking a photograph of one of these things, is it? This, um, no, this... no, not at all. Oh. It's like taking a picture through a mirror, I think, isn't it? Uh, Martin's coming back, I think. Does it look that way? Lost track of everything at the moment. Um, where's he gone? Oh, there you are. Oh, there you are. I'm back, yes. I got kicked out. I'm going to get back in again. Oh, <laughs> oh well, we we're just looking at this, this camera system here. Thank you, Peter. You see what it is? Yep. <laughs> A little tiny, it's about the size of a grain of salt, and it's got 1.6 million little little cylinders on there. Wow! Which is specially uh, controlled in size, in order to produce photographs. Uh, and we just went on to the. Is this the one? Oh, no, it's not the wrong one. Um, oh, this is the one. Yes, this is the. Uh, there's a result. There's a straightforward picture with an ordinary camera, and that's mm -hmm. one of the. The size of a grain of salt. Marvellous, better than mine. Well, it's just pretty good. And I think, mm. that, I think that's similar. I haven't really read it. pictures, images of flowers, previous, previous state, previous state of art, microscopic camera on the left, and the new design on the right. So they're just comparing. I think comparing like with like, with this new 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 process. There it is. That's how big it is. And this is from the Daily Mail. How about that? <laughs> you can win sometime. Right, moving on, moving on. Uh, they haven't defined what 5,000 times the size of an ordinary lens is. Then the size de defined the size of an ordinary lens. 500,000 times, come on. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I missed a few notes off. <laughs> it does, it? If they don't give you, there's no reference there, is there? Well, is, terms. is that the same as your 50 millimeter lens that you use on your camera they're talking about? I guess so, yes. They're talking about ordinary compact cameras and things. So it's 500,000 times smaller than that. Which is quite a lot less. 
Yes, true. Okay, right. This one here was a funny sort of thing. This um, the boy who is still crying wolf, thirty-seven years on, and it's all about um, the pharmaceutical industries. Uh, rise to dominance in the medical research at major universities. Uh, what are they, are they trying to, but what they're saying is that the pharmaceutical industries are promoting um, various things they make in order to uh, cure people, such as HIV. But what they don't say is that there are simpler ways of doing it. They suppress, in other words, other, other ways of doing the same job. Um, this, this article goes into that in this particular book, I think, we're talking about. Um, can I do the independent investigations of each drug that comes up for approval, but these investigations are funded by the companies that want their drugs approved. So it's a win-win for them. So, so moreover, when a cheap drug that is not sponsored is being reviewed, uh, especially if it threatens to compete, Blocking the, this is exactly what happens with the two inexpensive, highly effective COVID remedies, chloroquinine and invermectin. Um, Dr. Faust Chi, or whatever his name is, and the media managers from Silicon Valley were, all went to extraordinary lengths to discredit them precisely because they worked so well. First, chloroquinine was ridiculed by Trump as uh, Trump's folly. <laughs> as the Donald. Because Donald is so easy to ridicule. <laughs> Fallacious stories about aquarium cleaners were given high profile billings in the media. Yes, um, but Kennedy tells us a much more sinister chicanery. Clinical trials were designed to fail by limiting distribution to hospitalized patients when it was well known that chloroquinine is most effective in the early stages of the disease. Some trials were designed to kill people's dose, kill people dosage, to kill people dosage far higher than normal. One study that served to discredit chloroquinine was utterly fraudulent based on fabricated data, but it still did its damage. For the first time in history, doctors were forbidden to prescribe a drug off-label, and some doctors lost their jobs for doing right by their patients. The absurdity of calling chloroquinine dangerous was highlighted by the fact that literally millions of people in Africa and South America take chloroquinine daily throughout their lives where malaria is common. And then there was another example about this Invermectin, another safe drug used by millions of people, in this case, to prevent river blindness. And again, great propaganda was launched to convince people that it was unsafe. What they, so what they actually made was a thing for, um, uh, for, for AIDS. And what's it called? Um, this is all to do with the anti-vaccine people, isn't it? It's, it's their way of saying, any vaccine is not safe. It's disinformation, Richard, isn't it, I think? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I'm trying to think, what, what's the chemical they use for AIDS these days? The, the, but the, company, the, camp, the companies that manufacture it are making millions and millions of dollars. They are. Which, which Kennedy is that, Peter? Is that JFK or is that, is that Robert Kennedy's son? Uh, where's that? Where's that? Where's that? Lost it's, RF, it's, it's Richard Kennedy, is it? I presume he's one of the Kennedy clan. Could well be, yes. On the way, I can't see it at the moment. Because um, they had lots of children, didn't they? So, anyway, the, ah, here we are, AZT. That's what they uh, decided. It's called HIV, to... isn't it? I AIDS. Mean, yeah, that's right. But it, it's, it's no better than other things that don't cost anything like as much. But this costs, what is it, $10,000 a year's mm. treatment? Or twenty-four thousand dollars now. It was not. It was given not to just to, to. It was given not. It was given not just to. What the hell? Their English is terrible. I can't, I can't read it. Given not just to late now. So given to anyone who was HIV positive. Mm. AIDS groups, in fact, demanded it. The symptoms of AIDS poisoning overlapped broadly with symptoms of AIDS. In retrospect, the majority of people <laughs> die of AIDS were in fact poisoned by AZT. That's amazing, isn't it? That's Take this with a pinch of salt, don't we, I think? Yeah, well, this is what he says. All these uh, things here, he's saying. Uh, 
um, pumping up pandemic fears to lay groundwork for larger budgets, you know, fanning hysteria by exaggerating disease transmissibility. Ah, yes, and so on and so on. So I thought that was a rather <clears throat> worrying thing to read, really. And it goes on, doesn't it, his list? <laughs> As you say, Richard, I think it's by the non-vaxxing people. Yes, indeed. Coming out is propaganda. You can leave a comment if you wish. Are there any comments? Apparently no comments. Maybe. <laughs> Not um, any that you can see. But I thought that was an interesting article, the way they uh, commercial things come into much better than health. <laughs> right, next one. Um, or is it um, on? health is I'm going to have to go, Peter. Um, Bye. I was going to stop anyway to have a cup of coffee or something. <laughs> so, okay. Um, uh, Bye. Nice to see you next time. Yeah. Bye, Diana. Bye, Diana. Bye. Bye. Oh. Do we want to stop for a quick um, refreshment? I've well, had a cup of Easy either way. I mean, I've had a cup of coffee. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I've got, got drink. mine in my hand. I've got a drink of water. So, Well, some people really know how to celebrate. <laughs> well, what's wrong with water? You're not answering that one. <laughs> Has it been passed by the management? Of course. Um, right. Simpler design for quantum computers. We all like quantum computers, don't we? Um, Do we? <laughs> how are they going to make the next big thing, aren't they? And at the moment, they're very complicated to build. It's difficult to scale up and require temperatures colder than interstellar space to operate. <laughs> Bit of a challenge. Yeah, not very practical, are they? These challenges led researchers to explore the possibility of bringing using using the work on photons, using photons or particles of light. Um, the photonic quantum computers can operate at room temperatures. So there's an improvement. Um, although people have successfully created individual quantum logic gates for photons, it is challenging to construct large numbers of gates and connect them in a reliable fashion. That's the problem. You can do it in small scale, but uh, at the moment, but not necessarily a big scale. Uh, photonic quantum computers are readily made of readily available components, according to the paper. Um, so you have a, a laser to manipulate a single atom that in turn can modify uh, the state of photons via a phenomenon called quantum teleportation. The atom can be reset and reused for many quantum gates, eliminating the need to build multiple distinct physical gates, vastly reducing the complexity. I hope you understood all that. No. Absolutely. Oh, they actually, is, is, they say they can manipulate a single atom. That's all right. Is that being a laser to manipulate a single atom? Has that actually been done? Well, yes, there's a video down below in a minute, I'll show you. Um, uh, normally, you'd have to have thousands of quantum emitters, make them all perfectly indistinguishable and integrate them into a giant photonic circuit. Whereas this design, we only need a handful of relatively simple components. This, and the size of the machine doesn't increase with the size of the quantum program you want to run. Right, so this remarkably simple design requires a few pieces of equipment, a fiber optic cable, a beam splitter, a pair of optical switches, and an optical cavity. And these already exist, etc., etc. So, uh, well, if I move down to the video, here it is. This is how it all works. Are you ready? Ready, yep. steady? Yep. Yep, poised. No words, I'm afraid. But Photons from, come from the left hand and go around here and back, and then reversed and back. You have to watch these things at the top here. And that's it. It's a very short video. But I think the dustman have got around here now, um, Alan. I can hear, the, hear it happening. All right. So this is what it actually does. It says plain sections of storage ring and a scattering unit. The storage ring functions similarly to memory in the regular computer. 
is a fiber, fiber optic loop holding multiple photons that travel around the ring analogous to bits that store information in a classical computer. In this system, each photon represents a classical bit or qubit. The photon's direction of travel around the storage ring determines the value of the qubit. The direction determines the value. Amazing. Which, like a bit, can be naught or one. Oh, I see. Yeah. Additionally, photons can simultaneously exist in two states at once. An individual photon can flow in both directions at once, which represents a value that is a combination of naught and one at the same time. <laughs> well, I don't I believe that bit. <laughs> uh, the researchers can manipulate a photon by directing it from the storage ring into the scattering unit, which travels where it travels into a, to a cavity containing a single atom. <clears throat> The photon then interacts with the atom, causing the two to become entangled, a quantum phenomenon whereby two particles can influence one another even across great distances. Then the photon returns to the storage ring and the laser alters the state of the atom. Because the atom and the photon are entangled, manipulating the atom also influences the state of the paired photon. By measuring the state of the atom, you can teleport operations onto photons, he said. So we only need one controllable atomic qubit, and we can use it as a proxy to indirectly manipulate all of the other photonic qubits. Is that the path of the photons along the side of the car then? Yeah, along the side of the car, yes, I think so. Uh, you're as wise as me on all this. So I thought... <laughs> We've got to get used to this sort of language, I reckon. <laughs> Qubits and things. If you believe any of it, that is the, the thing. Well, that's a, yeah. I agree with Richard. Do you believe any of it? Well, yeah, I haven't seen a physical one yet. Um, so, um, yes. Well, I went so to an is... IOP lecture and didn't understand any of it. And all that it was was a the ring at CERN. They were using one in this country, a lot smaller, and firing sound waves at it. And they were showing you pictures which meant nothing. Okay, right. Well, we'll move on, I think, because <laughs> it is a bit weird, to say the least. Uh, green ammonia, that's much more up what we know about. We know about the, the Harbour Bosch process to produce ammonia, don't we? Yeah. Peter, I think we, we rely on you to be our um, <laughs> um, guide, our filter <laughs> for, for pseudoscience. Was that pseudoscience that we just look, looked at, or was it the real thing? Well, I've got a phone call here, gosh, from Robin Gemmell. You there? I am indeed on a U3A talk, yes? Oh, sorry. Okay, um, I'll um, make that. Okay, I'll make that. bye. Oh, I had to phone. How about that? I'm not used to this thing on, on smartphones yet. Um, anyway, um, Ammonia has been made by this Harbour Bosch process. It's been around for a, a, a hundred years or so. Um, but it is highly, um, it does lots of nasty things. Uh, you have to, um, so what, you have to read about the Harbour Bosch process and understand why do we want ammonia, first of all, to make all sorts of chemicals such as fertilizer, plastics, explosives, pharmaceuticals. And then the global, Ammonia industry pumps out 230 million tonnes of ammonia annually, and demand is set to rise to net to net zero in, as as the rise to net zero emissions progresses. Ammonia stores so much energy that has been proposed as a high density green fuel for hard to decarbonize sectors like shipping and aviation. Virtually all of the ammonia today is made by the harbour prop Bosch process. Natural methane gas is used to produce hydrogen, releasing six tonnes of carbon dioxide for every 1.1 tonnes of hydrogen. This hydrogen is then reacted with atmospheric nitrogen to produce ammonia, typically burning more natural gas to provide the necessary heat. Not only does this result in an estimated 1.8% of global CO2 emissions, all on its own. It's also responsible for nitrate pollution of groundwater, 
puts vast amounts of dangerous nitrous nitrous oxide emissions into the atmosphere, not to mention it consumes between 3 and 5% of global natural gas production totals. The gas extraction process itself spews methane emissions directly into the air, which acts as a, a potent greenhouse gas. Long story short, uh, if hydrogen Hosh, Harbour Bosch has to be put to bed if we are to get to net zero emissions. So, this is the bit that where, where it starts. While working on a separate project, attempting to make bleach out of salt water through electrolysis, Dr. Brian Sorianto, and working with that, an expert on phosphonium salts, decided to run some side experiments to see if these ionic liquids could produce ammonia in an electrolytic process. And to everyone's surprise, it worked. So these this is this is the tetrahedron these things with blue and three purples and what happens is the tetrahedral phosphonium molecules transport hydrogen ions from the anode to the cathode where they replace the lithium atoms in lithium nitride to perform to form ammonia ammonia molecules well that isn't quite clear yet is it um <clears throat> Anyway, they were me a bit like the cleaner that they have on the telly in the afternoon. All she uses is uh, white vinegar, white vinegar and a splash of soap or something like that. And that does everything. It, it replaces all the chemicals you can possibly think of. Yep. But why yep. are we bothering about all of this rubbish? Well, um, funny enough, you should, you should say that I had a thing from Greenpeace on 100 ways to save the planet sort of thing. And one of them was in the kitchen, it says use vinegar and um, what was the other one? But two, two quite common chemicals that will do everything. And funny enough, my cleaner last Wednesday said exactly the same to me. She was cleaning the um, glass on the uh, shower unit and she's using a spray thing with vinegar in it. Uh, and she That's said, what everybody uses. It's not, never, has nobody told the scientists this? Well, I don't know, but vinegar and newspaper, that was it. You had to use a boot newspaper as well. Um, right. Anyway, there's, I think, a video thingy here. That's the is, that a good, is that a good quality newspaper, Peter, or can we use the, the mail? You can use the Times if you wish. You can, you can use, uh, yes, you can use um, the Sorby Journal. Okay. She um, did say on the one well, I was looking at, the brain paper worked equally as well, for what it's worth. <laughs> yes. where, where was this video? I'm sure. Ah, here we go. This is sort of how it works. We've got a copper cathode, uh, an anode, um, I, and you've got, well, it should, I, uh, there's a definite video somewhere about that. Where's it gone? Ah, here we are. It's called the Monash Ammonia Project. And it's called Monash because that's the name of the university in Australia. Oh, uh, in Melbourne. Yeah. I think that's right. Anyway, so if I run this, you can see what it's about. Welcome to a brief look at some of the exciting work going on in our Monash Ammonia project and how our sustainable approach to producing ammonia actually works. Our interest is in capturing the massive potential that Australia has to generate renewables and to turn them into something that is readily transported by shipping pipelines to centres of population. Ammonia has emerged as an ideal carrier of this energy. So our work is focused on the direct transformation of nitrogen from the air around us into liquid ammonia using nothing else other than water and renewable energy. Ammonia is the main source of fertilizers today, but these are made from fossil fuels, accounting for a significant fraction of greenhouse gas emissions. Through our work, we hope to turn fertilizers genuinely sustainable. But as well as this, ammonia is seen as a carrier of hydrogen energy or for direct use in ammonia burning engines. So how do we do this? Let me hand over to my co-lead in this work, Sasha Simonov, to explain. Our process is very similar to what happens in a water electrolyzer to produce hydrogen. The difference being that we use electrolytes that are familiar in the lithium battery world. When current is applied across an electrolytic cell containing such electrolytes and also dissolved hydrogen gas, a compound called lithium nitride is formed at the cathode surface. The electrolyte should also contain a carrier of the hydrogen ions or protons. In a recent paper we published in the Science Magazine, we have shown that phosphonium salts can act as such proton carrier 
to produce ammonia in a highly efficient manner. The phosphonium cycles between the two electrodes, delivering its proton at the cathode and being replenished with the fresh proton at the anode, creating a continuous process that we have run for as much as four days. I'll hand over to Dr. Brian Saranto to show you what these phosphonium salts can do. The phosphonium salt we use is actually a liquid, often referred to as an ionic liquid. The phosphonium cation has a well-known tendency to act as an acid. In other words, it can give up a proton or two. It is a very weak acid, and that is probably what we need here so that we don't have too many other set reactions going on. Once the proton has to be passed, the neutral molecule form is called an elite and has a double bond between the carbon and the phosphorus atoms. And this is what gives it a very special property. One of our senior research fellows, Dr. Perun Ametisak, will explain how this helps to generate ammonia in a bit more detail. At the molecular level, positively charged proton carrier is initially attracted to the negative working electrode. The electrode surface is covered with the highly reactive lithium nitride. When it reaches to the surface, the proton carrier molecule releases one of its protons to the lithium nitride, in the process becoming what is known as an elite compound. The elite, now neutral, diffuses away, clearing the surface for a second proton carrier to deliver its proton. A third step like this finally produces a fully formed ammonia molecule which diffuses away from the electrode. The positively charged lithium ions remain near the electrode, ready to form more lithium nitride. And now I will hand over to a Huang Long, who will show you how to do this in the lab. So here we are in the other tube global. We don't want to handle our cell in the air because that can introduce nasty contaminants. We, our experiments are carried out in the cell such as this, um, with a fixed quantity of nitrogen gas and electrolytes. Here is the couple working electrode with the certainly called outer electrode is an anode. This is the core reference electrode, which allow us to monitor what is happening on the surface of the couple electrode. Fill up the cell with the electrolyte. And then we bring outside the global, introduce the nitrogen gas as much as 20 atmospheres of pressure. So we will start experiment. We run this for three days. Afterward, it's time to measure how much ammonia has been formed. In this lab, we have two main methods of quantifying ammonia. The first one, involves the generation of a highly colored compound. This compound can be easily read by a spectrometer such as this one. We have developed a particularly careful variant on this technique called the method of standard difference. Now, this requires the generation of a whole suite of standard solutions in order to test one sample. This can be quite labor intensive and can unfortunately generate a whole heap of plastic waste. The other method that we use is NMR analysis. Now, this technique is particularly exciting because we are able to measure the signal coming directly off the ammonia molecule itself. If we are particularly excited by a recent result, what we can do is use a slightly heavier gas called N15 nitrogen. And what this does is it can produce a completely different signal to the normal N14 gas. Now, while the N15 gas is much more expensive. It's also very valuable because what it does is it makes us completely sure that the nitrogen in the final ammonia product is indeed the result of the gas source that we are pumping in. So we hope you've enjoyed this quick run through of our ammonia process. If you'd like to keep in touch, you could follow us on Twitter or on our website. How do I get out of this? <laughs> um, yeah. Lost track of it. the end yet, Peter. Oh, yeah, but still can't find the. Oh, I see what it is. Probably it's, it's at the bottom of my screen. I can't quite. Oh, I've got to it.
couldn't see couldn't see the bottom of my screen. Uh, right. um, <laughs> so that's a weird thing, isn't it? <laughs> um, do you think that's scalable? To, to set the thing this size? <laughs> difficult to know. Very difficult, isn't it? Yes. It's a long way to go with that one, I reckon. Okay, moving on to the next on the video show. Ah, oh, this is one of yours, Richard. The, yes, the, it is. This is the uh, F-35. Yes. 100, 100 million pound of joke, I suppose you would call it. Yes. Yes. Um, it's, we're sorry, just you, um, uh, Martin. Um, a complete cock-up by the, <laughs> the Navy, I suppose. Um, I have this air aircraft that nosed over the edge of the boat, end of the boat, and the pilot ejected, only for his parachute to snag on the car carrier's bow bows. <laughs> Had he gone underneath us, the Queen Elizabeth, or been caught by one of her two propellers, he may not have survived. I wouldn't think he would. Anyway, this is the video here. Um, it's apparently on, on Twitter. Just adjust the screen a little bit. There we go. Yeah, it, it was a legal one that hasn't really been released. Oh, yes, it's not. Yes, it's illegal. There it goes. This is the best we can find at the moment. It doesn't appear to be going fast enough to take off to my mind. That was it, wasn't. Splosh. And he comes down and the parrot just fits full in his parachute. Yeah. Because he's on the end of the ramp. <laughs> I thought it was very amusing. Uh, well, yes. Um, Yes, uh, we are aware of the video circulating online. It's too soon to comment. The F-35 crash took a place a couple of weeks ago as the carrier task force sailed to the eastern Mediterranean after coming back from the Pacific and the South China. <coughs> um, it was hosting, this is a curious, isn't it? Hosting 10 US Marine 35, F-35s, as well as eight jets from, from the UK. And we've lost one of those eight. Uh, 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 speculation about a protective cover that had been mistakenly left in place. But that, that wouldn't account for it going slowly, would it? Or would it? Hmm. Flying operations continued despite the accident. Oh, they're now worried about finding, getting the thing back. <laughs> Recovering the... Uh, thing before a hostile. It's got, it's got a vertical engine. Presumably that wasn't going either. Uh, right. Yes, presumably. Anyway, the recovery efforts are ongoing. Uh, hmm. Normally it would take 18 months before their findings are made public. The unlucky pilot qualifies for Martin Baker's ejection tie club. <laughs> <sighs> So, I like yeah. them calling it boot note. Which way? It's called boot note, not footnote. Oh, I see. Yes. Yes. Wonder why. <laughs> Just to be amusing. Well, there are 155 comments on this one, which is quite a lot, isn't it? Have a see, see what they say. Uh, Mill spec technology, the most overpriced lemons money can buy. <laughs> But the trouble is, they used to have Boscombe Dane to test these things, but they, they've done away with Boscombe Dane effectively. Really? Oh, gosh. Oh, yeah. I know all, all Boscombe Dane is fly drones over the Middle East. <laughs> Got through. Um, we end up sending special forces. The requirements are not mill spec, but Everything had to use AA batteries. <laughs> uh, hmm. Yes, well, um, they'd have a battery pack for something called radio, right? Duracell, there. <laughs> Going on about AA batteries all the time. Um, and the bog rolls, yes. Oh, this is all. The thing is, you've got to use AA batteries because you can't use lithium batteries anymore. Oh, on aircraft? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Hmm. Well, not on military ones. I think you can on civil ones. 
Voting to be cleared by the FAA. But... Well, that's what all that is about, yes. A short-haired lady friend of mine once related that Panovia Tornado had regular air audio cassettes for its programming, with the logic presumably being that spares in the field would be quite plentiful, assuming you were happy to tape over Nina or Kraftwerk. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, yes, I see. Yes, uh, uh, and so on. Rather embarrassing, yes. <laughs> but just to lose one must be embarrassing on a result for the Navy. Absolutely, yes. Terrible. Terrible. What on earth did go wrong? On the bright side, the ejection was absolutely timed to perfection. It was almost like they practiced at that very specific failure condition. <laughs> Uh, somebody says that automatically triggered in certain conditions are achieved. For example, speed too slow. Yes. Um, yes, yeah, so that's where the ejection came in. Yes. The U16E seat is found on episodes to be completely self contained and has no automatic ejection function. That is true of every military ejection seat in the UK for many decades. It's an interesting piece. The optimal sequence for man seat operation, separation, get it right, is calculated by a triplex channel sequencer on the seat where the worst case is zero, i.e. no forward speed. Which is Can I ask can I ask Richard why we still have manned aircraft? Wouldn't drones do the job now? Uh very good question. I, I think the payload of the drones is the problem, and nobody would dare fly, should we say, an F-35 under electronics, if that's the word for it, because they, they suffer from the same problem, they crash in the sea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then all these radio waves are not so, exactly secure, that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so that was quite an interesting one, yes. Um, well, worth reading some of the comments. So I'll leave you to do that later. The next one is a brief exposure to infrared light improves your vision. How about that? You don't need to get your cataracts done. No, oh, so I see. I'm not convinced about that one, though. <laughs> I'm not sure it does that, but um, it helps to stimulate the mitochondria cells in her retinal cells. So as we age, our eyesight naturally declines. So older drivers should take another test. Oh, sorry, I didn't read that. Um, <laughs> that was on the radio this morning, wasn't it? Uh, and yesterday was that. Uh, the new study found exposing our retinas to short bursts of seven, 670 nanometers, which is not that deep, is it? Um, in the morning can improve color contrast vision by nearly 20%. Um, that's simple to do, isn't it? I've got I want that proved, but I th if it's right, it would be a good idea that we actually did that. Well, we've, all, we've each of us got six seventy nanometer filters, haven't we, for our cameras? Yeah, but where do you get the where do you get the red light from? Well, it, light coming through it will be will be at that wavelength, surely. But what you're saying is just look through the viewfinder. Yeah, or or just put the fil the filter over your face, <laughs> over your eyes. Yeah, okay. the other side. Might work. It says that briefly exposing the eye to deep 670 nanometer light on a daily basis for just two weeks in, in, in improved division of elderly subjects. Hmm. What do I mean by brief? Um, these tiny factors produce a molecule called adenosine triphosphate. The gas that fuels our cells. As we age, these functions gradually desire, decline. Less ATP is produced, leading to decreased cellular functions. Our retinas age incredibly rapidly. What? And some estimates indicate ATP production uh, can drop by up to 70% over a human lifespan. Hmm. So, uh, so this is something we can each, each do ourselves by using a red filter 
and putting um, between oh between eight o'clock and nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so we need to do a chroma test. Yeah, where do we get the red light from in the first place? That's the bit I'm not convinced about. You use a 670 nanometer filter for your camera. Yeah, well, that's where does the light come from? Daylight, oh, night light, night light, light. light, LED light. Well, if it's if it's um, an old tungsten light, it's got plenty of infrared in that, hasn't it? Um, oh yeah, probably has. I hadn't thought of that. Yes, I haven't got any tungsten bulbs, so. <laughs> Why uh, do you have to do it between eight a.m. and nine a.m.? Oh, don't ask me. What? <laughs> Just, that's what they did, but you need this chroma test, whatever that is. Um, on average, researchers developed detected 17% improvement in the chroma test scores several hours after the red light exposure. In older subjects, the improvement was greater than 20%, and benefit was found to last at least one week. Ah. Um, Why do you need to do it every day if it lasts one week? Uh, Three minutes. I'll tell you the time there. Three minutes. Um, it doesn't say every day. There's just one day. I thought it did earlier on, but perhaps not. I thought it did. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the same experiment on a smaller cohort months later, but delivered the exposure in the early afternoon. No improvement at all was detected, suggesting circadian cycles play a significant role in the mitochondrial response. <laughs> Theo Brown tells you. Yeah, yeah. A simple LED device once a week recharges the energy system that has declined in retina cells, like recharging a battery. And morning exposure is absolutely key to achieving improvements in declining vision. Hmm. So there we are. So simple. You see, a LED is not really a LED. It, LED can have a color temperature from anything from about a thousand K to eight or nine thousand K. Well, you want it to be 670 nanometers. Yeah, but where did you buy one of those, I wonder? Well, we I haven't know. got that films anymore. <laughs> Can we nom nominate Richard to do a trial exercise on this? No. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Brian? Oh, you're, always, you're always ahead of the curve, Richard. Yeah, I didn't realise that, but I'm not convinced about this one. If I was, I might be prepared to. What what what's wrong with it, Ren Richard? Well, I don't technically nothing as far as I'm aware, but I'm not convinced it actually works. But it's not it won't do you any harm, I don't no, think. No, but then would it do any harm if I just looked at the sun every morning? Um it must, that'll ruin your eyes, Richard. Don't you know that? No, you just look at the indirect reflective light of the sun then. <laughs> we need to get a chroma test first. Ah, yep. of course. And let me have a look. I don't know what that is exactly. I must see if I can find out what it is. Um, can you see what I'm doing here? Yeah. Get chroma test. Uh, da, 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 da. Is that the one? Chroma blind test. A proprietary colour blind test. Well, is that, is that it's a variation on Ishihara, is it? How much? Is it the Ishihara test? I don't know. Ah, oh, about the test method, chroma test. That's quite a lot about it, isn't there? Um, chroma test, let's, I'll look at this one. Uh, test results available in three hours. What? Uh, sensitivity, oh, I see. Yeah, sensitivity 10, 4, more or more. selectivity up to. Uh, very hard to read this blue writing. Um, well, I had to quickly check chroma subsampling used by the test is simple. Just as I'll have a, have a look at that one, shall we? If it works. Aha. Using your 4K, you, you, uh, I see. Is that what we want? I'm just using your monitor. <laughs> <coughs> I don't think that's what we want, is it? That's just to check. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's what we want. I don't think that's what they were talking about, was it? And all these YouTube, what's he doing? <laughs> hmm. 
Maybe this is the one really. The Probability Colorblind Test. I'll try and put it on a separate link. You just use cards for that, don't you? Use what? Oh, what? Oh, what? Shop. Oh, God, what's all this? I've got to buy something, have I? Got a nice white screen here. Oh, I'm just take them away. Right. Uh, what was all this about? Enchroma. Color blindness test. Got to go to pages and test. Uh, You haven't got to buy something because it says shop now. Seven. That's the Ishihara. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was saying in the first place. Yeah. Press seven. But press five then, Peter. Four. Eight. Ooh. Five, I think. One. Eight. Nine. Five. Eight. Mm. Nine. Nine, yeah. Five. You see, I can't see that one where you said five, interesting enough. Six. Yeah, That's I can't eight. See that. I can't see that one either. Does no. anybody know what that is? No. Three. Five. Hmm. <laughs> I can't hear you, Peter. No, his sound's gone off, but he's not muted, is he? He is now. True. But he, he wasn't. He's talking away, but he is muted at this point in time. Yeah. Can you unmute, Peter? Should we send somebody round? Yeah, I think so. Can't, still can't hear you, Peter. No, he's looking in red. That's the trouble. It's the infrared that's masked his eyes. <laughs> he's probably shining on his vocal cords for all of his glasses. Oh, it could be, yes.
Better. New microphone, everything? Yes, yeah, sounds a lot better. Is it, I can't see it at the bottom of the screen all the time. It's just disappearing. Well, if, you put, um, if you put the cursor right down there, it will appear. Uh, yeah, I can see. Ah, oh, it keeps things popping up in front of it all the time. Very tricky. He said, oh, it's, it's now working with that particular microphone. Yes. Yes. Why did you start with the other one then, out of curiosity? You've gone muted again, Peter. Right. Okay. That should be back. Yeah. Why it suddenly decided to stop? I have no idea. Instead of colour blind, it's gone something else. Um, Anyway, ear, ear blind. Share the test. Tell your friends. Well, I've never done an online test for colour blindness before. But that was quite interesting. Yeah. Um, right, where were we? Uh, on that one. That was the one, wasn't it? Yes. The, 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 infrared, the infrared to cure your eyes. Yes. So that's how you do, Richard. There you are. You have a tube with a torch, an ordinary torch. And a red filter. Yeah, I haven't got one like that, unfortunately. There you go. I've got a torch exactly like that. Oh, yeah. I got one that's not exactly like that, but it's similar. I think it's even red, the one I've got. That, that's mine, but it's not red, it's black. Now hold on, hold it up a minute, round. I can't see it at the moment. Still can't see it. Why aren't you big? Because I'm not talking. Well, I know, but I can I'm still... muted, and if I'm mute, I think I'm muted, am I? No, you're not muted. I, I pinned you, but it's still, yeah. not... Oh, still not doing it, is it? Well, that's, that's my torch, but what do I use for the red bit? Could I use my finger, for instance? <laughs> Why not use a, a 670 nanometer filter? Where do I get one from? Well, any, any photographic supplier will tell you, will give you one of those. I'll give you one, all right, fair enough. I'll go in castle cameras then. Yeah, they're bound to have a spare one they don't want anymore. I may even have one of my own um, to give you as well. Um, anyway, so uh, I'll have a look at that one later. Moving on, <laughs> it's only a quarter of an hour to go. Snapdragon. Yes, now this is interesting about um, thing for Android flagships. It reveals Snapdragon and Gen 1 whatever that means. Um, Snapdragon 888 <coughs> was announced a year ago, and now they've revealed it properly as Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 to enable 200 megapixel cameras and 8K HDR video on your mobile phones, um, desktop level mobile gaming, and boost faster download speeds over 5G. Right. This is not the first mobile chipset upgrade since the launch in December 2020. Qualcomm announced a plus variant back in June. And then there's the Motorola's 200 G200 on the ROG, what's it? So there's all sorts of things about this chipset. So I think this is a chipset that does all sorts of things for future uh, Android powered phones and another. Uh, another. Alan, you, they're El, El, Guid, El Duino, I think you call them. And Do I? I uses them all the time for producing pictures, text, anything. You can buy the software libraries for them, so you don't even have to write the code. You have to have to patch it together, but you know where I'm coming from. I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about, Richard. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> when, I want, when I wanted a thing to read out my weather station, yeah, it was suggested I used an Arduino computer, which are pence almost, and they've got like a USB port, uh, everything you can think of on them. But you add bits to them to make them into a real computer, right? But you can, you like, you can make them into a TV camera if you want to, or a, a video display. And the software to drive it is actually supplied with the bit that you're buying. Right. So all you have to do is merge it with the existing code that's in the thing. Hmm. How amazing. And you've got one of these. No, I haven't. Oh. Alan's, Alan's got dozens of them. He uses it everywhere. Oh, dozens of them. My word. Well, how do you spell this, Duino? 
I don't know, ELD Survivor, I guess. Let me see if I can put it on the search. Um, is it just the letter L? D yeah, I think. W what? EL, I think. L Duino, EL. Oh, oh, EL. And how do you spell Duino then? D W? Right. Like that? Well, it could be. I don't That's know. First one down, El, El Duino. Oh, yes. Oh. I missed that. Um, let me go back a moment. Um, oh, it's gone altogether. Um, e L D I W. Uh, uh, it was D U I. That's what came up there. Oh, D U I. Yeah. Uh, so this should be a U. Yeah. Oh, is it gone? No, oh, I pressed something accidentally. Um, so and that the, I should be a U. No, U I, no W. No W, right? Like that. Yeah, that's what came out. Elduino link one. Uh, Elduino there. El Next, there. That one, yes. Ah, yes. Raspberry Pi accessories. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. So it's a Raspberry Pi thing, really, is it? Well, yes and no. Nobody calls them Raspberry Pis anymore, but yes. No, oh, it's E L E here, and E L D. It's completely different spelling there. Yeah, I can't answer that. So one of them's not right, and one of them is right. This says E L E again. Yeah, but you see what you've got. Almost every semiconductor manufacturer is manufacturing them and they all call them their own thing. I see. Well, let's try the top one there, see what happens. Oop. L E L Duino, Raspberry Pi. Oh, yes, it's yeah, all there. That's what it, it looks like. I, I missed what it looked like. It's disappeared. <laughs> that. That what thing there, that? yes. That yeah, bit there. Yeah. Like that. That bit. The two, the, the bits you nearly got your pointer on are the USB sockets. Uh, um, there. there. Yeah, there. That's, that's the USB sockets. The processor is in the middle there somewhere. Yeah, right. Um, there, probably. That the, that the internet is the one you've got your hand over. Oh, that bit? Yes. But it's all built into that bit. Let's talk about the way they spoke choice. I like that. <laughs> yeah. The great gadgets, price, and so <coughs> Oh, here we are. So is this where they are? They're yeah, all well, right this, this is the things you can make from it. Or with it. It's all in dollars, this one. Oh, well, it doesn't matter, does it? I mean, no. it's the principle of the thing that you were looking at. Out of stock. Mm, yes. So what you want is the one that, um, well, well, Anders got one on his desktop, which he uses to tell him what the bit currency is, because he trades in bit currency. <laughs> it tells him what the exchange rate is every ten minutes. I think it is. So, you can, well, oh, these are these are um, these have got aluminium cases. I see. Yeah, just cases for the things. You normally plug additional bits into them, if you know where I'm coming from. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. The entire installation process takes only two minutes. Mm. All the all the connect is open except GSI camera and GPIO connection connectors. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. Cooling fan is included and a screwdriver. I don't think Alan ever goes to that length. He just has the bare board. End of story. He doesn't have the cased one. Yes. Uh, well, this is the cheapest one I could find on this website. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, so, yeah, L, L, well, I mean, you can make a full size desktop computer with them if you want to. Well, like this sort of thing, yes. Yeah. And there we are. Yes, it did say that, didn't it? Where's that gone? That was there, was it? No, like that. Yeah, probably, yeah. Gene point, yes. Touch monitor or. Um, that one there, 13 inch portable monitor. Yeah. So we don't need to buy a proper computer anymore. No, absolutely not. And they work as well as a proper computer, like the one I've got here in front of me? Probably better, if the truth stands. <laughs> it's less, less to go wrong. <laughs> 
will it run these um, weird programs that are coming these days? Will it look at HEIC images and things? I suspect the answer is yes, but I don't know what you do about memory. Ah, yes, there is a point. That is a point. You need a case to put them in, of course, I guess. Well, uh, I'm, 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 I'm just as it's spread on the desktop, you can see the PCB. Well, it's got other things here, or, or Arduino, um, drones, Internet if, of Things. If you've got a drone, you have, that's what's in a lot of the drones. Yes, yeah, I expect they are, yes. That's, but Internet of Things as well, um, accessories. Yes, oscilloscopes, RF Explorer, and the QB board. So if we go to the Raspberry, uh... I think the only problem with this is they only do one function. You know, like a desktop, you can do umpteen things on it. This is you build to perform that function and that function only. I did buy a Raspberry Pi for my son, but, and he was very delighted with it. And I even got him a keyboard to go with it. And oh, I, haven't yeah. heard a, I haven't heard a single thing since then. <laughs> ah, perhaps you ought to tap him up and say, what are you doing with it? Yes, yes. If it's anything like my son, I said, well, under that very expensive car you bought for your son. He said, oh, it went wrong and I just chucked it in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> that was only a year ago, so that goes to us to show. Right. Okay. Let's move on a bit. It's uh, nearly, nearly uh, time to stop. Um, right. Another six minutes. Uh, anyway, all I was saying is these are the things you can do if you've got the, if you buy the right bits. Right. Okay. Gravitational waves could reveal dark matter clouds around black holes, as this sort of trying to show. I think this picture um, has turned dark matter has turned hypothetical particles into ultralight bosons and gravitational wave detectors have been deputized for the hunt. So how about that? Um, so here we are in dark matter again. <laughs> I was using the bizarre new dinosaur species, but there you go. I got, I got carried away then, Peter. <laughs> OK, fair enough. <laughs> All the matter we see in intro uh, only accounts for 15% of the matter. The vast amount is tied up in dark matter. And um, so what exactly dark matter is, what properties we have, et cetera, et cetera, nobody knows, yes. The ultralight bosons are one such candidate. Bosons are a class of particles that includes photons and the legendary Higgs boson. Some models that suggest undiscovered versions may exist with extremely tiny masses. If they do, they might help plug one of the biggest holes in our understanding of the cosmos. Hmm. It's almost impossible Peter, to... Yep. Peter, may I jump in and ask yes. you, all you, you guys whether you get frustrated like I do watching these astronomy programmes and not knowing whether it's an artist's impression or a true photograph from the Hubble telescope? Very good question. I think most I usually of them... have a fair idea, to be quite honest. Uh, you can take most of them as being made up, I reckon, these days. But if you well, they, have photo, they have um, images which look like photographs of from Hubble telescope, but the stars moving across them. Yeah, well, that wouldn't happen, would it? No. So, no, no. I mean, that would take so, uh, the hundreds of uh, years. Are they, are they artificially animating, but behind it is a true photograph from the uh, Hubble telescope or not? Oh, I think it's all done by animation. I don't know whether there's any photographs involved. It's all well, done why by... can't we see the Hubble telescope photographs then? Well, I don't know. Because oh. they're not Peter. these days are not exciting enough. They don't move, you see, because they're just static photographs. How about oh. that? <laughs> I don't know any more than you do, Brian. <laughs> I just wondered whether that it's actually some sort of time lapse, you know, that they're, they're re and some then putting together a video of sort of photographs taken over several days or years. Can I, suggest, animate. Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Why not send an email to Brian Cox? <laughs> <laughs> well, I get my son, my my nephew, uh, my grandson to ask him. Yes, all right, do that then, whatever. 
<laughs> if you had Diana here still, you could have asked her. She asked the gentleman who gave us a talk last time. Oh, her, her son-in-law, yes. Yes. That was quite good, wasn't it, that? Very good. Thoroughly yeah. enjoyed it. Um, anyway, this is, this is the artist impression of a black hole, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'll leave that one and go to the next one briefly. It's another quick one. Um, this was asteroid analysis suggests some of the Earth's water came from the sun. So I thought that was intriguing. Um, I would have thought it would have boiled off, but there you go. Well, that's why it's so peculiar, isn't it? Accounting for where all the Earth's water come from is a long-standing puzzle. But international has proposed that the sun may be a major source of the planet's H2O by way of hydrogen from the solar winds. So uh, the Earth is the true outlier of the solar system. Unlike the other small rocky planets, Earth's surface is only three quarters covered by uh, three vast oceans of liquid water. Where does this come from? The number of series, the most popular ones, shortly after the form of the steady rain of C-type carbonaceous meteorites, which differ from standard ones in that they contain hydrogen and, need, and oxygen. It's a hypothesis that dovetails with what we know about such meteorites, but there is a problem. The ratio of the isotopes of hydrogen and carbonaceous meteorites doesn't match those found in terrestrial waters very well, so what is the alternative? Rain. Has nobody told them that we have a weather forecast here every so often? <laughs> yes, Richard. <laughs> yes. I know I like this sentence. Uh, our world-class atom, atom probe tomography system at Curtin University allows us to take incredibly detailed look inside the first nano, 50 nanometers of the surface of the Itakawa dust grains, which we found contained enough water if scaled up that would amount to about 20 litres for every cubic metre of rock. See, highly significant, I feel sure. <laughs> anyway, it's midday now, and so I think that's time that we um, said stop. Um, I, Peter, I'm missing Sheila's mince pies. Oh, well, I've got some in the fridge, but uh, they, were, oh, right. they were Tesco's, I'm afraid. <laughs>